Good evening, and welcome to Trinity Community Church to this Pennycook Churches Together service. Let's join together in our call to worship, which should be on the screen. There are words from Psalm 36. Your loyal love, Lord, extends to the skies. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. Your righteousness is like the strongest mountains. Your justice is like the deepest sea. We'll sing our first song. Faithful one, so unchanging. Our call to prayer comes from Psalm 78. The people's hearts weren't firmly set on God. They weren't faithful to his covenant. But God, being compassionate, kept forgiving their sins. God took back his anger so many times. God kept remembering that they were just flesh, just breath that drifts by and doesn't come back. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you see not only the outside, but the inside. You're not taken in by external appearances. You look into the inner depths of our being. We thank you for the reassurance of your love, the confidence through Christ we can have, that though we often go wrong, breaking your commandments, failing to live as you have called us, that there's mercy for those who earnestly seek it. We thank you that you see not just the outcomes in our lives, but the initial intention, that you know whether we really desire, honor, and respect you, whether we long to be better disciples of Christ or whether our love for you has dwindled. Help us to allow the scrutiny of your Holy Spirit to enable us to step into the light of your presence. For we know we can never deceive you with outward show. Though our lives may appear blameless, our faith strong, our works good, and our words right, you and you alone know the reality in our hearts. So, in that light, we confess our sins in the quiet to you. Father, let us hear again these truthful words. If we are living and walking in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Gracious God, in our worship tonight, help us to lift our hearts to you. Fill us with your spirit. Immerse us in the love of Christ and raise us up as new people May we no longer live to ourselves, but to him who died for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Bible reading tonight comes from one of the servant songs of Isaiah. From Isaiah 42, starting at the beginning. This is my servant. I strengthen him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets. He will not break a bruised reed. And he will not put out a smoldering wick. He will faithfully bring justice. He will not grow weak or be discouraged until he has established justice on earth. The coasts 
and islands will wait for his instruction. This is what God, the Lord, says, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I am the Lord. I have called you for a righteous purpose and I will hold you by your hand. I will watch over you and I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations in order to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those sitting in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord. That is my name. And I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. The past events have indeed happened. Now I declare new events. I announce them to you before they occur. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a great pleasure to have Jordan with us. Uh, Jordan, who's just finished being the South Community Pastor at City on a Hill. Thank you, John. <clears throat> and thank you for having me. I'm going to start with a question. Not particularly light or easy question. Have you ever felt like a failure? Has there been a time, maybe even recently? No. no. Not for you, Martin. <laughs> Not for you, Martin. When you failed spectacularly. Let's take a moment to maybe think on that. Maybe it was recently. Maybe there's still a sore spot there for some of you. I know I have in many times. As you think on that moment, I want to ask you, how would you have felt in that moment if at the peak of your failure there was someone who could take over for you, who could come alongside you and gently guide you and restore you and then do what you could not do. Can maybe you'd feel, can you think of the relief you'd feel in that moment? If you've ever felt like that before, I believe this, <clears throat> this passage in Isaiah 42 has something to say to any of us who have ever felt like that or maybe feeling like that tonight. See, in the book of Isaiah, in the servant song, in chapter 42, Israel, God's people, <clears throat> in many ways, had failed. God's people had been taken into exile for their sin. God had punished them and then promised that fallen Israel that he would return and restore them, and he did. But more than that, in Isaiah 42, Isaiah proclaimed that God's people, Israel, would become God's servants. And it was Israel who would bring justice and light to the nations. And Isaiah paints this picture in the chapter of what that would look like in a perfect world. Unfortunately, this is not a perfect world. And God's people, as is always the case if you read through the Bible, they didn't live up to that. Isaiah's prophecy was not fulfilled in the way that the original hearers and readers may have thought. Yet when we look at Isaiah 42 through the lens of Jesus Christ, as Matthew's gospel does, for example, the servant Isaiah talks about turns out not to be Israel, but to be Jesus himself. And as is very often the case in Old Testament prophecies, Isaiah's prophecy turns out to be fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. You see, it would be Jesus who would redeem his people. It would be Jesus who would set them free and become everything they couldn't be. It would be Jesus who would bring the light to the world and who would bring, bring justice. And I think it's fitting as we go into Holy Week to look at the person of Jesus Christ for a moment tonight, using this passage from Isaiah as our guide. And there is so much I could say on this passage. It was really, really hard for me to narrow it down to 
John said, 20 minutes, call it an hour. It was really hard for me to narrow it down. So I'm just going to hone in on two things very briefly tonight. First of all, Jesus is justice. Secondly, his gentleness. His justice and his gentleness. You look at verse 1 in the verse there. It says, with God's spirit upon him, this servant will bring justice to the nations. He will bring justice to a world that is marred and tainted by sin and death. And you know the reality of sin in this world, it's plain to see around us. It's plain to see at its deepest level in death. John was just telling me earlier, even just the past week, it's three funerals, I believe, that have come upon this community. Death is real, it's horrible, and it's all around us. And statistically speaking, every one of us here tonight will one day die. Now, I know it's Monday, I'm sorry, you're not getting off easy, okay? You're not getting off easy. For some of us, though, our bodies are already failing. Maybe you're experiencing that just now. Maybe you're feeling the results of the brokenness in this world already, in your body. Disease, decay, pain, grief. These are all sin's effects on our natural world. But sin affects what we do as humans as well. Some of us have had injustice done to us. Some of us have been involved in injustice towards others. And all of us, in one way or another, because of sin, we have all done injustice before God. And Isaiah 42 shows us God's servant, his son Jesus, who is sent to bring justice to the world. Justice that he will bring and is today bringing. And the, the Bible it offers us many pictures of Jesus. One picture it gives of Jesus is him coming as a righteous judge. To use the Bible's language, treading the winepress of God's wrath underneath his feet. In the Gospels, we see scenes of demons, the forces of darkness, terrified in the presence of Jesus, begging him for mercy, seeing something terrifying in him that the disciples could not see at the time. Make no mistake, Jesus is Lord, and he is a strong Lord. Of that, there can be no doubt. Jesus is not some tame, nice guru who tolerates injustice and sin as many today might want him to. He is, as the Bible describes him, the Lion of Judah. Fierce, strong, and protective over his own. Or as C.S. Lewis would allude to in Narnia, safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And Paul in Philippians says that one day every knee will bow before this King Jesus, including today those who reject him and laugh in his face. In the New Testament, in a very difficult way, sometimes paints a picture that for those who do reject Jesus, for those who do make a habit of causing injustice before God and before others, the day they stand before him, for those people, it will not be a good day for them. But rest assured, Jesus will bring justice to this earth. And no abuser, no perpetrator of evil will be able to escape his grasp. Every wrongdoer who seems to somehow escape justice in this life, which is so often the case if you look at the news, every wrongdoer who seems to escape justice in this life will not escape justice in the life to come. And for those of us who suffer today with the reality of sin in our own lives, our own indwelling sin, Jesus offers justice on our behalf too. By dying on our behalf and paying the penalty for our sin, he offers forgiveness to all who would trust in him. And for those of us who today wrestle with sin in the form of death and decay and illness in our broken bodies, Jesus' resurrection shows that death, our great enemy, that great injustice death, will one day as well be defeated. And that death will not last forever. One day death will come under its own sentence. And it will be destroyed, church. 
Our broken bodies will one day be restored in the fullness of resurrection. Cancers, organ failure, infections, grief, death itself. The Bible tells us the sufferings of this present world will be swallowed up and replaced by life and new resurrection. So Jesus has brought and he will bring justice to this world. And as Christians, we wait eagerly for that justice. So Jesus brings justice, but he also brings gentleness with it. See, Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords. He is a conquering king who is powerful, who is mighty, and yes, even at times, who is to be feared. Yet the servant's song in Isaiah 42 shows us another side of this king. You see, Jesus the lion is also described elsewhere in scripture as a lamb. This king and conqueror is also described as a good and gentle shepherd. Look at verses 2 to 4. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. These verses talk of a great gentleness, a meekness about Jesus. I read about a nature documentary um, that I saw recently. And it was about crocodiles. And what, the crocodiles, apparently, they have one of the strongest jaws in the world. They're able to tear apart animals and beasts like it's nothing. They're the strongest jaws, sharp teeth. They can knock down animals three times their size and just tear through them like a kid tears through wrapping paper. But something else is amazing about crocodiles. See, they've got these stupidly powerful jaws. But apparently they also carry their eggs in their mouth. And what you find about crocodiles is, amazingly, those same jaws that can knock down great beasts and crush bones and tear flesh, they're able to carry and hold a delicate egg, not as big as this, between its teeth without breaking the egg or even cracking it. What what that showed me is that gentleness is not the absence of strength. It's applying strength to the right place. And that's something we see in Jesus. You see, verse 3 talks to this imagery of a smoldering wick, a faintly burning flame, or a bruised weed. And these images, they talk of the most delicate things. We should think of a bruised reed in the wilderness, ready to break and snap at the slightest touch. Or it gives you an image of a a smoldering wick, a flame so tiny, thin, and pathetic that the smallest gust could blow it out. Has anyone here ever had the displeasure of trying to light birthday candles outside? (laughs) Ever tried it? It is impossible, right? If you're doing, my son's four, I try. You get one, two, three, four, that takes you 15 minutes. You think, great. You get to the fourth one, and by the time you finish that, a breeze has come along and blown out all your hardest work. It is a displeasure. But even this, because even the slightest breeze can extinguish a weakly burning flame. And these pictures the Bible gives us, it's, it should be encouraging for us, encouraging for us tonight. For these images of weakness can bring hope and encouragement to those of us who find ourselves weak in this world. I mean, let's just be honest. Sometimes as Christians, no matter how long we've been followers of Jesus for, sometimes... Our faith, it's weak. Sometimes our faith often looks like a a faint flame hardly flickering in the darkness than a shooting star or a burning fire. Sometimes my own faith looks nothing more than a pathetic burning wick with a smoldering flame that actually it's hardly even noticeable if you looked at it. Sometimes that's how small my own faith can feel at times. And I don't know about you, but sometimes in life it feels just like Life circumstances, sin, the world, or even the, the devil himself. It's like, it's like everything's out to try and snuff this little flame of faith that we have left. hope I'm not the only one that knows what I'm talking about here. Yet Jesus will not take offense, even if our faith is pathetic and lowly burning. Isaiah 42 tells us that he is patient with the weak. 
He is gentle with them. And if all we have left is a sliver of faith, the Bible promises us that Jesus will not snuff it out. When we feel bruised and battered, condemned and guilty, hanging on by a thread like a reed in the wind, the promise of Isaiah 42 tells us that Jesus will not break us. In fact, he embraces us. John shared a quote with me. Uh, recently, and maybe you shared it with you recently as well, but I just want to share it um, from Richard Sibbs. It says this, Never fear to go to God, since we have such a mediator with him that is not only our friend, but our brother and husband. Let this keep us when we feel ourselves bruised. Think, if Christ be so merciful to me as not to break me, then I will not break myself by despair. Sebs talks about this image of Jesus being like our husband. This imagery of the Bible, the New Testament especially, often uses. It talks of us, the church, being the bride and Jesus being our husband. And it's a funny image if you're married. I think about myself, I am not a perfect husband by any means. In fact, a lot of the time, I'm not even a good husband, actually. But there, there are a few times in my house when I'm able to handle my husbandly duties well. A few moments where there's things only I can do that no one else in the house can. And moments that make me kind of stick my chest out and think, you know what, yes, I am the man of the house. Yeah, that's me. For example, if I'm in another room and I hear a scream from the other side of the house, it's a very particular scream. If, if, if I hear that certain scream, I just know what it means that someone has found either a mouse or a spider and they are not equipped to deal with it. I am the, thankfully, I am the only person in my house equipped to deal with those problems. You see, when my children hear us see a spider in their room over their bed before they go at night and I hear that scream, they don't run to their mum, right? Frankly, she would be useless, right? She would, <laughs> she would rather board up the door, burn the house down and let house and shoes deal with it than try to deal with the spider. So what the kids do, they run to me. When there's a spider there, and you know what I do? I go through the kitchen, I get my glass, get my little envelope and a bit of paper, and I walk through the room, my chest puffed up, thinking, yes, that's it. I'm the man of the house. Just this, this one little moment, I get to feel like the man of the house, and then I get the spider, I throw it out, and then I kind of realize five minutes later, it's probably going to die a worse death than if I just crushed it, but we'll think about that later. Or when there's a mouse that's been caught, and my wife and my daughter are cowering on the bed, saying, Jordan, get it, get it, get it. My son and I are the ones who end up dealing with it. And you know, when I'm in the house and I hear those screams for help, I don't laugh at them most of the time. I don't ignore them. I help them. Why? Because they need me in that moment and they cannot help themselves. And my duty as a husband tells me that I must go and help them. And so it is with Jesus and his church. Christ is our husband, and he is a good husband towards us. He is not harsh with us. He does not shirk his responsibilities. He does not ignore us when we cry out to him. He does not say no when we come to him, needing his help to do what we cannot do ourselves. He does not reject us when our faith is weak and when our lives are filled with failure and guilt. Jesus is tender with us. He's gentle with us. He's loving and merciful towards us. And he joyfully, joyfully cares for those of us who belong to him. No matter how little our faith may be or how impressive we may look. My son recently started collecting bottle caps. It's a nice little hobby he's got. And the thing about finding bottle caps, nine times out of ten, you find them in the gutter, right in the, the harbor that's hard to get. And you pick them up, they're often grimy, covered in mud, and who knows what else. But he likes collecting them. And what he does is, we bring those bottle caps home, we give them a wash, wash the mud off, we scrub it clean. And even if it's still a bit grimy or a bit rusty, my son delightfully takes them into his room, puts them into his box, and they become his treasured possession. And when we come before Jesus, the truth is we often look unimpressive. 
You often look dirty, maybe even a bit, a bit grimy, a bit rusty. But gentle Jesus, he washes us, he makes us clean, and like my son does with his bottle tops, he calls us his own, and he treasures us as his own. When we find ourselves like bruised reeds, Jesus does not break us, he remakes us. He does not bend us, he mends us. And as we look forward this week to that beaten, bloody and bruised Jesus hanging on that cross, we remember that Jesus Christ, who was bruised so that he can deal well with the bruised, who was crushed so that he can help those who today feel crushed, who was tempted and is now able to deal gently with those of us who are being tempted, who knows what it means to feel helpless and weak, so that he too is able to draw near those of us who feel helpless and weak. Jesus, as Isaiah goes on to say, is the one who opens our eyes. Jesus is the one who releases us from our bondage to sin, who brings us to light from darkness, who writes all of our failures and promises to keep us and care for us forevermore. Like that crocodile who is both fearsome and gentle, Jesus is loving and caring with those who belong to him. Jesus is the same shepherd who both crushes the serpent's feet and also gathers his lambs in his arms, as Isaiah says in chapter 40. I'll finish with this. Jesus is the servant in whose love and whose mercy says to those of us who would trust him tonight in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Thank you, Jordan. Let's worship our Jesus now. You may know this song because we sang it last year, but it's a long time since then. Um, so if you, it's easy to pick up, uh, but even if you can't, just use it as a vehicle to worship God. Your name is Jesus. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, your spirit sets us free from hastiness and angry tempers, from harshness and ill will. Help us so to live in the brightness of your presence that we may bring your light into dark or cloudy places. Take our hands and work with them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think with them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you and all your people. For your name's sake. Amen. Our next song is The Everlasting Arms. May God our Father be kind and gracious to you and bless you with peace. Amen.